Hi everyone, welcome to today's wellness video series. My name is Joy and I'm going to be talking today about imposter syndrome. Um, so we're going to go over definitions. What is imposter syndrome? What does it look like? How can it impact you and students, um, specifically graduate students? And hopefully we'll outline some tips and tricks um, to help manage imposter syndrome. So to get us started, let's define what imposter syndrome is. It's important to note that imposter syndrome is not a mental disorder and it's not classified as one in the DSM, but it's more of a phenomenon. And it's something that is seen in samples of high achieving populations. Um, and it's really characterized by persistent feelings of inadequacy and self-doubt, um, fears that others will explore, um, expose one's fraudulence or feeling like a fraud. Um, and typically it's notated by external attributions to success. So the reason I succeeded is because X, Y, and Z happened to me and internal attributions of setbacks. So the reason I failed is because it's my fault. Um, and so imposter phenomenon or imposter syndrome can really manifest in different ways. We can see it in your thoughts, your feelings, and in your behaviors. Um, in terms of thoughts, a lot of Thoughts that people have when experiencing the imposter phenomenon can look like, I don't belong here. What gives me the right to be here? Everyone is so much smarter than me. Um, I don't have a place here because no one in my family has gone to higher education. Um, and thoughts related to fraudulence. What if they see the real me? All of this is a um, like a ploy and I'm going to get in trouble. Um, and this can really cause some difficult feelings and emotions to deal with. People who experience imposter syndrome report experiencing a lot of anxiety, guilt, shame, embarrassment, and confusion. Um, and some share feelings of sadness as well. And as a result, many people with imposter syndrome will behave in different ways. So when experiencing positive praise, may minimize or reject that praise or choose not to internalize it. They may have trouble taking up space in, in areas where they don't feel confident and they feel like an imposter. Um, it might lead to procrastination of activities um, so that an, an avoidance. Or on the other side of things, it might lead to perfectionism and overworking to make up for perceived inadequacy. And so all of those things may be a factor in how you experience imposter syndrome. Um, and really importantly, there's a cycle that can happen with imposter syndrome, and it's called the imposter cycle. So it starts with a project or a piece of work that's required, um, and the initial feelings may be anxiety, self-doubt, worry. And like I said before, the way that we respond to that may be in over-preparation or it might be in procrastination. Um, and so when we over-prepare, we feel relieved when it's done. And when we get positive feedback, our explanation for that positive feedback is like, well, I killed myself over this. I, you know, stayed up multiple nights doing this. And that means in order to do well, I need to exert myself this much. Um, and so in that sense, we're discounting a lot of our own skills and abilities that we brought to that project leaving us to feel still like an imposter, feeling self-doubt, and more anxious about the following piece of work that may come. If you're the type of person who goes in the other direction um, of procrastination and avoiding um, getting the project done, um, when it finally is submitted or presented, whatever the, the piece of work is, you may feel a real sense of relief. Um, and this time when receiving positive feedback, it's really easy to kind of attribute that to luck, right? Oh, this time I got away with it. Um, and so in the same way, rather, if, even if you over-prepare or you procrastinate, there is a tendency to ignore or push away positive feedback, continuing that cycle of feeling like a fraud, experiencing self-doubt um, and heightened anxiety. And so the next time a project is assigned or a piece of work is assigned, that cycle continues and the anxiety is often heightened because we never learn that, you know, you are really able and capable of accomplishing these projects because we consistently explain it due to overexertion of effort or pure luck. Um, 
So a lot of things can contribute to imposter syndrome. Um, and many, many people experience it, especially in higher education. And so the first thing is you're really not alone in these feelings of being an imposter, feeling like a fraud. Um, and some factors that, you know, based on your lived experience might exacerbate these feelings. So one is sociocultural factors. So depending on sort of the environment and culture that you grew up in, you may have experienced higher levels of microaggressions, biases, or discrimination that have discouraged you from feeling confident in your abilities in your field of work um, or study. Another sort of lived experience that may increase feelings of imposter syndrome are related to family of origin. Many people may experience a lack of a validating environment and are taught lessons growing up that you're not worthy, that you're not good enough. Um, and those things can really be internalized. Um, and then outside of external factors, people may also have individual tendencies and traits to be have more negative thoughts, experience more self-doubt. Um, genetically, people may be more anxiety prone, perfectionistic, and have tendencies to procrastinate. And so all of those different factors can really contribute to experiencing heightened imposter syndrome. Um, and really a high percentage of graduate students do endorse feeling this to an extent. And so again, you're not alone in this. So now that we understand what imposter syndrome is, um, what it can look like, how it can manifest, what can we do about it? So there are different ways that we can target having imposter syndrome. We can target our thoughts and our co cognitions, and we can also target our behaviors and how we choose to react to feelings of self-doubt and anxiety. So let's start with our thoughts. Um, something that you know we often encourage um, in therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, is the act of evaluating and challenging your thoughts. Um, we can recognize faulty assumptions, practice positive thinking, and importantly, we can start to identify when certain aspects of our cognition are inaccurate, unhelpful, and actually further exacerbate the cycle of the imposter syndrome. So when we're experiencing um, thoughts about imposter syndrome, feeling like we're a fraud, like we don't deserve to be there, that we're going to get found out, a lot of things might be happening one of which is mental filtering. So the idea of mental filtering is our tendencies to focus on the negative um, while ignoring the positive. I'm sure you've experienced this before. Um, an example that I commonly use is if you're at a job evaluation and your boss is outlining all of these amazing things that you've been contributing to the team and the hard work that you've been putting in and at the end of the evaluation goes, oh, but one thing I think you can work on is X, Y, and Z. And the rest of the day, the only thing you're thinking about is that X, Y, and Z, um, and practically ignoring all of the positive things that were said. And this is something that people experience across the board, um, not only in graduate schools, but in different fields of work, and is, is really common and can often happen without us realizing it. So a first step is in identifying these faulty assumptions. Um, another sort of mental trap that we can fall into is catastrophizing. So this is when we expect the worst case scenario and we really minimize the possibility of positive things happening. So when I was describing that cycle and that loop of the imposter syndrome, um, having the presentation or piece of work sort of put in front of us, our first assumption may be to catastrophize the impact and the challenge of this project and expect the worst thing to happen. And so when we set ourselves up to have the worst case scenario happen, that really heightens our anxiety. It can often be paralyzing um, and can be really hard to focus and concentrate and make it harder to actually accomplish the work that you are able to do. Um, another really common thing that can happen when faced with the imposter syndrome is something called emotional reasoning. And so that is when we take into consideration how we feel and we just assume that it's true. So if I feel anxious, it must be because something bad is going to happen. Um, if I feel guilty and like I'm a fraud, then it must be true. Um, and this is a 
sort of example of where our own biases and our own feelings about ourselves can be translated or thought to project onto other people. And we think that they think the same things as us. And so that happens also without us thinking. And the last thing I want to point out is polarized thinking. So all or nothing, black or white thinking that really ignores the gray area and nuance in a lot of the things that we do and the ways that we work. And so this can often look like for grad students, if I don't accomplish everything on my to-do list today, today was a failure. Or if I wasn't able to attend 100% of the lectures this semester, I really let that professor down and I'm a bad student. Um, and this is a really common trap that we fall into, especially when we hold ourselves up to such high standards, which so many graduate students in higher education do. Um, you know, there are high expectations and a lot of pressure that people put on themselves that a lot of the nuance of the work that you are accomplishing is ignored. And so a lot of the common things with these these uh, unhelpful thinking traps that they share is an aspect of ignoring the positive, minimizing the positive things, um, ignoring nuance in situations, and beating yourself up based on, on negative feelings. And so once we're able to identify when that's happening, the next step is to try to reframe those thoughts. Um, and this may be having alternative explanations for negative experiences, adopting a growth mindset, um, and really focusing on, on motivation rather than inhibition. Um, and so when you're engaging in this cycle of thinking, in this habit of thinking, um, the steps you can really take are to pause, notice what thoughts you're having, having, Name how it might be unhelpful or even inaccurate. Let's recognize the evidence for and against, and then acknowledge that this is a normal sort of process to happen, and it can very much feel automatic. But our process of pausing and taking a second to acknowledge when we're having these thoughts is really a first step in changing them over time. Um, and it's really hard to work against these constantly internalizing negative and self-diminishing messages. Um, but it's a helpful reminder sometimes that it is just a way that you think, not necessarily who you are. Um, and so there's a separation a little bit of our automatic appraisals of situations of ourselves and who we actually are. Um, and so it's a this is a start in a practice of self-awareness and mindfulness to work towards introducing more positivity to therefore minimize stress and anxiety that can often be paralyzing. Um, and of course, sometimes we do experience negative things or setbacks um, that can really exacerbate feelings of the imposter syndrome. When that happens, we really have an opportunity to reframe the experience. Like I said, with imposter syndrome, the more common experience is to attribute external um attribute successes to external reasons. So I did well because my teacher was really lenient on grading and we attribute failures to internal attribution. So I did poorly on this test because I'm a bad student. Um, but those are really subjective ways of looking at these situations. And so when we do face a setback, um, we can choose to reframe or at least open up the ability to think of alternative explanations for why things happen. Um, so a bad grade or a poor review does not need to speak to who we are, but rather what we can do differently for a more desirable outcome next time. Um, and that way we're not so focused on why these things happen, but how you know we can change what we do for next time or open up a discussion about things that feel unfair um, to others. The important part is not to let these experiences and feelings of imposter phenomenon become a part of our identity um, because it can often spiral into doubt and really paralyze us from moving forward. Um, and then when we look at our behaviors and examine them, there are a lot of things that we can do 
to help make this process of examining our thoughts and changing them a little bit easier. Um, so one thing is to really keep your accomplishments in view. These are some habits that we can start to develop. So this can mean um, record and store. So when you accomplish something, make a note of it, check it off your to-do list, um, tell a friend, whatever it can be to really give yourself the acknowledgement that you did something. I think with graduate school, there's always something else that can be done, right? Whether it's another reading, another assignment, another paper, another presentation, it's really easy to get caught up in the what's next. And so often we ignore um, the accomplishments that we did have just before that. And so one way of doing that is to, you know, write it down, use a checklist, and really just take a moment to acknowledge your accomplishments. Um, and this is serves as evidence, right? Evidence that you are capable of being here, that you deserve to be here, um, that you're able to accomplish what it is you need to, and evidence against all of those thoughts that are telling you otherwise, that you're a fraud, an imposter, and that you don't deserve to be here. Another behavior you can sort of engage in or have it in is shifting how you talk about yourself with others. Um, you know, really thinking about how you feel and like strong doer language rather than passive helper language. Um, when in graduate school, a lot of projects are related to groups. And so we, as graduate students, may refer to ourselves may defer ourselves to supporter roles. I helped or I partnered rather than I collaborated or I coordinated. Um, and research on discourse analysis says that 67% of people reported higher confidence when using stronger language like this. And so it really allows us to take ownership of our work and ability instead of attributing it to external reasons and giving it away to other people. Um, and another suggestion is to really start talking about your feelings of imposter syndrome. Um, like I said before, so many people, especially in graduate school, experience the same symptoms of imposter syndrome. And when we hold on to those and hide it and feel a lot of shame about it, it often can just grow and we mistakenly believe that everyone else holds a different opinion from our own. Um, and that could not be further from the truth when it comes to imposter syndrome. So it can be really freeing to discuss these feelings of not being good enough or feeling like a fake. And more often than not, it will probably reveal that others around you have felt the same way at some point. Um, and if you're in a position of leadership or management, this is also a great opportunity to model for peers or people under you by having honest and open conversations about the imposter phenomenon experience. And that way you can start to create a culture that breaks down the facade of perfectionism and help work through it. So you can serve as a mentor or you can find mentors through talking about it. And if you need help, ask for it. Um, and the last thing that we have as a tip is to really keep social media um, as a snapshot of someone's experiences, not their entire holistic self. Um, and what winds up happening is we compare our innermost criticized version of ourselves with everyone else's outwardly portrayed version of themselves. And that can really exacerbate or heightened feelings of imposter syndrome. Um, LinkedIn, social media, other forms of social media really highlight people's accomplishments, especially in your field of research. And that can often make us feel worse about what we haven't been able to achieve, where we're not in comparison to them. Um, and so you can recognize what's happening in that engagement so you can learn to healthily acknowledge it instead of letting it negatively impact you to the same degree. So all of that in mind, um, main messages that I want to share is that you're not alone. Imposter syndrome is something that is very normally experienced, but it doesn't have to stop you from moving forward and achieving your goals. Um, you know, to learn more, you can always come to the Wellness Center and find more resources there. Thank you for listening. I hope you guys have a great day.